¿Qué tal todos? My name is Jolie Molina again, coming at you with the second episode of the Redwood Exploration Series, made possible in partnership with Latino Authors and Save the Redwoods League. And for this month's episode, we traveled a little further up north to Ore, California and reached the Redwood National Park, home to the tallest trees on earth and the tallest tree in the world, also known as the Hyperion. For this episode, we'll be exploring the Lady Bird Johnson Grove. Before I begin exploring the trail, I would like to acknowledge that we are on your rock land. All right, let's continue. The Lady Bird Johnson Trail is a 1.5 mile loop trail. As you can see here, it is considered an easy to moderate trail. So it's friendly to anybody who has very little experience hiking or is more experienced. <laughs> It's an easy casual walk, well, described as an easy casual walk among some of the tallest conifer trees. The Hyperion being the tallest tree reaching 115.85 meters converted into feet would be 380.1 feet. And this is Lady Bird Johnson. Her actual name is Claudia Alta Johnson. She was known for her advocacy for preserving the outdoors. This kind of advocacy is important, as the outdoors is a privilege that everyone should enjoy. Being mindful of how you interact with the forest ensures its presence for the future generations. Now let's continue with the trail. Railroads have seen most of the world's history as they've been around for approximately 20 million years. And although for some time they were being cut down, they persisted and programs like Save the Redwoods League helped protect them, which allowed other programs like Latino Outdoors to build the connection between humans and the natural world. All right, let's continue. Mm -hmm. As you may assume, the Redwood National Park is predominantly made up of The scientific name being Sequoia sempervirens. The second most common conifer you'll see is Douglas fir, the scientific name being Pseudosuga menzaceae. Not sure if I pronounced that right, but that's the scientific name. The park is mainly composed of old growth trees. This is different from the Arcadia Community Forest because the Arcadia Community Forest is made up of second growth trees. The old growth trees are super important for threatened species like the or then spotted owl, the, marb the marbled murrelet, and the coho salmon. All right, let's continue. This is the red huckleberry. The scientific name is Vicinium parviflorum. And right underneath is the evergreen huckleberry, the scientific name being Vicinium ovatum. This is another understory shrub or small tree, and it's called the Pacific rhododendron, and the scientific name being rhododendron. Ro rhododendron macrophyllum. And here it is. This species is similar to the azaleas. Alright, let's continue. Do you guys remember what this is? I'll give you a clue, it's edible. However, I'm not eating this one because it's dusty. It's a redwood sorrel. So this is kind of like a perfect place to tell you about how the redwoods reproduce. They usually reproduce asexually, meaning when they're being cut off, a lot of the seedlings kind of like sprout on their own and they create other trees that are like right next to each other. This is kind of an example of how the roots intertwine and grow together. Right, referring to the first episode, do you guys remember what kind of tree this is? I'll give you a clue. The life veins look like eyelashes. And the common name rhymes with mascara. It's cascara, Ramnus persiana. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Another common shrub, understory shrub, that you'll see similar to the Arcata Community Forest is the drops of gold. If you turn it around, this is where the flowers would bloom. 
So for forest management practices, they use low intense fires because this is what a redwood could handle. Sometimes they do scar up, but because of their thick bark, they're able to persist through it. So the fog that's usually present in the morning is how the redwoods usually get about 25 to 40% of their water content. And the fog usually prevents fires from happening. As you can see here, this tree right here experienced a fire within itself. Despite its fire scar and its hollowing out, the tree remains alive, as you can see based on its foliage. So fires are a good and bad thing depending on how it's managed. So if a fire is managed and it's like low intensity, that's usually pretty good for the forest because it's a good forest management like method because it gets rid of fuel loads and fuel loads are like basically leaf litter that falls from the trees that could catch on fire. As you can see here, this is leaf litter. It's basically when the leaf falls off the tree and it dries out. Like a contained fire is good for the forest. However, if there's a wildfire, um, it could be a good thing and a bad thing depending on where it's burning. So redwoods can handle only so much from a fire. They usually like low intensity fires and they're able to surpass that because of its thick bark. However, really strong wildfires could lead to the death of redwoods. However, that still helps them re-sprout because it helps with um, seedling dispersal. The Yurok tribe used to have prescribed fires that would help with um, the germination of seeds or um, to help with providing more raw material for their baskets. And this is it. I know the trees are super big but the cones are super small. A lot of people describe the little I forget what they're called, but they look like um, puckered lips. So here are two redwoods growing alongside each other. And the way they're able to persist through like wind disturbances or other natural disturbances is based on its roots. Though, although the roots only go six feet under, they spread 50 feet wide. And that's why they're able to like keep themselves rooted. If you're also not sure about whether it's a redwood, you can look at its bark. It's usually fibrous and usually called a redwood because its wood is red. <laughs> this is usually its bark and this is usually what prevents it from catching on fire because it's so, it has a really thick layer of it. So as I mentioned before, another common conifer is the Douglas fir, the scientific name being Sudasuga menzaceae. And this is the cone. People say that the bracts look like a mouse's tail and legs, so it looks like it's climbing inside the cone. So this is the cone, and that's its bark with a lot of furrows throughout the whole tree. And the furrows are the little cracks that you see inside the tree. And underneath the Douglas fir, I spotted a spittle bug. As you can assume, it's called a spittle bug because it looks like spit. And these bugs use that spit to protect themselves. Another common understory shrub is the wood rose or the dwarf rose. Its scientific name is Rosa gymnocarpa. Be careful with its spikes. <laughs> So this species right here is the dwarf organ grape. The scientific name being Berberis, Berberis nervosa. Although others may know it as cascade barberry. 
This other understory shrub is called a California hedge nettle. Its scientific name is Stachys bullata. In the previous episode, I mentioned that there was another understory shrub or understory tree named the red alder, scientific name being Alnus rubra. And just like in the Arcata Community Forest, they're right here in the Redwood National Park as well, as you'll see right here. Let's get a little closer. <laughs> And these are its leaves. Okay, so here's a sign regarding um, the goal of the Save the Redwoods League that was founded in 1918, which their goal was to purchase redwoods and convert the land to public trust. And here's a picture of the Save the Redwoods League in the 1920s. So right now we just ran into a tan oak and the scientific name is Meltholithocarpus densiflorus, as you can see here. Many people have asked me why I chose to study forestry because it's not a common major for a Latina. And I never really have an answer to that question because it's true, there are not many Latinas in this field. However, when people ask me this question, I do keep the forest in mind. Hence my concentration in forest conservation. Because if you were able to walk into the forest and feel what I feel, you would understand why the major was the easiest decision I ever made. The connection I have with the forest cannot be put into words. It's more of a feeling you would have to experience in person. I've been using the forest, the Rikita Community Forest to be more exact, as a classroom for the last four years. And every time I go into the forest, I feel privileged to learn all about it, from the plants, to the animals, to the ecosystem. Knowing more about the forest deepens your connection and makes a walk in the forest more powerful, as you're more aware of the forest complex systems. And I would say the connection with the forest is the reason why I chose forestry. Muchas gracias for listening to my perspective of the Redwood Forest. I hope I encouraged you all to seek your connection with the forest. I think it's an important aspect of life for you to explore your relationship with the natural world. It gives you a place to reflect, breathe, and allows you to take a break from the outside world. In the next episode, a friend of mine and a former outings leader from the Latino Authors Humboldt chapter, Andres Sanchez, will teach you about the giant sequoias. All right, thank you for walking through the redwoods with me.